chapter 9, verse 18. Romans chapter 9 and verse 18. Therefore, hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. So what that verse is saying, obviously, is that God has mercy on certain individuals. He hardens other individuals. You can see that the verse starts with, therefore. It's obviously connecting that verse to what is said prior. So go up to verse 15, if you would. <clears throat> For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So when verse 18 talks about God having mercy on whom he will have mercy, I think that's a reference to verse 15 with regard to Moses, where God has selected Moses to a specific position of service. Men do not earn God's blessing. Does a man have the ability to, to go out and say, I'm going to do this and this and this, and therefore, God, you have to bless me? Well, it doesn't work that way because men are, men are sinful creatures. So what God does is he chooses to have mercy on whom he has mercy. Now, what the second part of verse 18 says is that whom he will, he hardeneth. So does God harden people? And the answer scripturally is yes, that he does. God does harden people. In this context here, who is it that God hardens? And it's Pharaoh, right? Because look at verse 17. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. So God hardens Pharaoh, but we need to understand scripturally what that means. There is an awful lot of confusion about what it means in the scriptures when God hardens someone. So let's dig into that. The first point that we want to notice, and turn with me to Mark 6, verse 45, is that hardening doesn't necessarily mean lost. Hardening doesn't necessarily mean lost. In other words, people sometimes look at the word harden and they say, oh, what God does is he hardens people and they're therefore lost and they can't do anything about it and they're damned because God hardened them. Well, look with me at Mark 6, verse 45. And straightway he constrained his disciples to get into the ship and to go to the other side before unto Bethsaida while he sent away the people. Skip down to verse 51. And he went up unto them into the ship and the wind ceased. This is when the storm, the tempest arises. And they were sore amazed in themselves beyond measure and wondered... Verse 52, for they considered not the miracle of the loaves, for their heart was hardened. So were the disciples' hearts hardened in Mark 6? Yes, obviously they were. Well, does hardening always mean lost? No, because were all the disciples lost? No. So is it possible to have a heart that is hardened to some aspect of truth? and still be saved? Yes, because not all the disciples were lost. Look with me at Mark 8, verse 14. The first thing that I want to just demonstrate to you is that hardening does not necessarily mean lost. It just simply doesn't. Mark 8, 14. Now the disciples had forgotten to take bread. Neither had they in the ship with them more than one loaf. And he charged them, saying, Take heed. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the leaven of Herod. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, It is because we have no bread. And when Jesus knew it, he saith unto them, Why reason ye, because ye have no bread? Perceive ye not yet, neither understand. Have ye your heart yet hardened. You can see here that the disciples had hearts that were hardened to certain aspects of truth. Does it mean that they were lost? No, it doesn't mean that they were lost. So the first thing we need to understand about hardening is that it doesn't necessarily mean that someone is lost. The second thing we need to understand is this. Scripture says that both God 
and Pharaoh hardened Pharaoh's heart. So look with me at Exodus 8, verse 15. Exodus chapter 8 and verse 15. Exodus 8, 15. But when Pharaoh saw that there was respite, in other words, there was relief from a plague. But when Pharaoh saw that there was respite, he hardened his heart and hearkened not unto them as the Lord had said. Well, in Exodus 8, 15, who is it that hardens Pharaoh's heart? Pharaoh, right? He hardened his heart, and that is clearly Pharaoh. Get Exodus 4, 21. Exodus 4, 21. And the Lord said unto Moses, When thou goest to return into Egypt, see that thou do all those wonders before Pharaoh, which I have put in thine hand, but I will harden his heart, that he should not let the people go. In Exodus 4.21, who hardens Pharaoh's heart? God does. So one verse says that Pharaoh hardens Pharaoh's heart. Another verse says God hardens Pharaoh's heart. So how does that work? Does God harden Pharaoh's heart on Tuesdays and the other days of the week, Pharaoh hardens it himself? What's going on there? Well, what's going on there is this. We need to understand scripturally what it means when God hardens someone's heart. So get Exodus 7, verse 1. Exodus 7, verse 1. What we're going to try to understand here is how does God harden someone's heart? Exodus 7, verse 1. And the Lord said unto Moses, See, I have made thee a God to Pharaoh, and Aaron thy brother shall be thy prophet. So Moses is a God to Pharaoh in, in this chapter. Verse 2, Thou shalt speak all that I command thee, and Aaron thy brother shall speak unto Pharaoh, that he send the children of Israel out of his land. Based upon verse 2, what is it that Moses and Aaron are going to speak unto Pharaoh? Well, it's going to be all that I command thee. So what are Moses and Pharaoh going to speak? God's words, right? Read it again. Thou shalt speak all that I command thee. What is it that Moses and Aaron are saying to Pharaoh? And it is what they were commanded to say of God. So what is Pharaoh reacting to or responding to? It's God's word, isn't it? Because Moses and Aaron didn't go to Pharaoh and speak their own opinions. They didn't make stuff up. It wasn't conjecture. They spoke all that I command thee. Verse 3, And I will harden Pharaoh's heart and multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. God hardens Pharaoh's heart in response to the word that Moses and Aaron spake unto Pharaoh. And what did they speak unto Pharaoh? God's word. In other words, what's happening is Pharaoh is responding to God's word and hardening his heart. Have you noticed, do men sometimes ever hear the word of God and say, nope. They do. Look with me at Proverbs 29, verse 1. Proverbs 29, verse 1. Now, Proverbs 29, verse 1 has a, a critical principle that we need to understand. Proverbs 29, verse 1. One, he that being often 
reproved hardeneth his neck, shall suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. Now, based upon that verse, Proverbs 29, verse 1, when does a man harden his neck? Something happens before that. And what is it? Reproved, right? Isn't that what it says? Mm -hmm. He that being often reproved hardeneth his neck. Here's the idea. The way that human affairs work is someone that is disobedient, that is rebellious. They can be given instruction. In other words, don't do that. Stop that bad behavior. And the appropriate response is a change of heart. It's a change of heart to a disobedience, right? So in other words, if you have a child that's disobedient and you reprove them, how should the child properly respond? The child should respond with a change of heart and say, I am now going to be obedient. I'm going to obey. It's in my best interest to do that. But does human nature have the ability to say, I hear your reproof. I don't think so. And the ability to be more stubborn and to harden in their rebellion. If you've known human beings for more than, say, 12 seconds, you realize that men have a choice there, right? That, in other words, they can either respond in repentance and obedience, or they can respond in, who do you think you are to tell me what to do? Isn't that an aspect of human nature? It is. Now, what Proverbs 29, 1 is saying, he that being often reproved does what? Hardeneth. In other words, responds to the reproof by saying, nope, not doing that. Well, now let me ask you this question. Where does reproof come from? Get 2 Timothy 3, 16. 2 Timothy 3, in verse 16. 2 Timothy 3.16. And 2 Timothy 3.16 explains the purposes for which the Word of God is given. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, notice, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So let me take Proverbs 29, verse 1, and 2 Timothy 3, 16, and put them together. Proverbs 29, verse 1, He that being often reproved hardeneth his neck. So the hardening is in response to what? Reproof. Well, where does reproof come from? The Scripture. So the hardening is in response to what? The Scripture. And what men sometimes do is they harden themselves to the Scripture. And I'm going to suggest to you that's exactly what happens in Exodus. Because what does God send Moses and Aaron to do? Does he say, Moses and Aaron, what I'd like you to do is go to Pharaoh, and I want you just to tell him whatever your opinion happens to be at the moment. And then the next time I send you, just make something up and tell that to him. Is that what God does? Or does he send Moses and Aaron with the specific words that God commanded them to speak? That's what happened. So when Pharaoh rejects Moses and Aaron's words, what is he truly rejecting? What he's rejecting, what he is hardening himself to, is God's Word. That's what's happening. Now, let me ask you this question. Before God sends Aaron and Moses to Pharaoh, does God know how Pharaoh will respond? Does God send them and say, I'm just curious. I wonder what will happen. I have no idea. Let's try it and see what happens. 
Or does God know beyond a doubt what exactly is going to happen? He does. So what I would suggest to you is this. God hardens Pharaoh's heart, and he says it in advance, not because God reaches into Pharaoh's torso, grabs his heart, and calcifies it, but because does God know that he's sending his word? Yes. Does God know how Pharaoh is going to react to his word? Yes. So does God decide to send his word knowing how Pharaoh will react, and therefore God hardens his heart, not by violating Pharaoh's free will, but by having perfect understanding of how Pharaoh will respond to his word and sending it anyway. That's what's going on. It's not God violating Pharaoh's free will. Let me give you an example. This is an earthly example. So think of baseball. Can a pitcher through study know if I throw this pitch in this location, the batter's going to swing? Because I've watched a thousand of his at-bats, and I know that if I throw him this pitch, he's not going to be able to resist it. And that's that baseball players do that. They, they study things and they, they anticipate how someone is going to respond. Now, when the pitcher throws that pitch, is he violating the batter's free will? Does the batter say, oh, well, I don't have any free will, and so now, therefore, I must swing? <laughs> is that it? Or does the batter have free will, the batter is doing what the batter wants to do, but the pitcher has advanced knowledge of the batter's tendencies and habits. That's what's going on. It's not a violation of free will. It's just an understanding of what's likely to occur. Now, the difference in that metaphor and with God is the pitcher has a guess. Does God absolutely know beyond doubt what will happen? He does. Look with me at Matthew eleven twenty three. 23. Now, while you're, you turn there, let me ask you this question. As you reflect on life, you may often ponder things like, well, at that point in time, when I made that decision, what would have happened if I'd made a different decision? And people sometimes ponder things like that. And what is the answer to that? And the answer is, we have no way of knowing, right? Because th that knowledge is not privy to us. Look with me at Matthew 11, verse 23. And thou, Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, shalt be brought down to hell. Now notice this. For if the mighty works which had been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. That verse says God has such complete and perfect and total understanding that he not only knows everything that is, he knows everything that would be if things were different. In other words, God knew if, if I had performed these works in Sodom, he knew exactly how people would have responded. Is there any knowledge that's too great for him? Is there anything that's beyond his grasp? Nothing. So when God sends Moses and Aaron to Pharaoh, does God know what's going to happen? Yes. And God hardens Pharaoh's heart in that he sends them. But does God violate Pharaoh's free will? No, he doesn't, obviously. Look with me at John 12, verse 48. The point I'm trying to show you is that, John, is that God hardens someone's heart, not by violating their free will, but sending his word to them knowing that they will reject it. Look at me at John 12, verse 48. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words. 
hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. Get Revelation 22, 17, but let me make this point. The most dangerous thing you can do today is to reject God's word for you, to you, right? Does God desire that all men be saved? He does. He's made salvation freely available. But what happens is that man in his self-righteousness rejects the word of God. And when you reject the word of God, which testifies to the Lord Jesus Christ, what do you end up doing? You end up rejecting the sacrifice that Christ made on your behalf. Look at me at Revelation 22, 17. This is one of my personal favorite verses. And the spirit and the bride say, come, and let him that heareth say, come, and let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. What a beautiful verse. And the idea there is, God has the water of life, and is he curmudgeonly saying, this is for a select few that meet my criteria, and I may give it to you or I may not. Just depends on what kind of mood I'm in. Is that how God reacts? Or is it, here's the water of life. You know who can have it? Anyone. And you know what it costs? Nothing. That's how God feels about mankind. That's how he feels about salvation. Whosoever will. Anyone that wants it can have it free of charge. That's God's attitude. So my, my point in saying this is people get the idea sometimes, well, God hardened this person so he couldn't believe the truth. Absolutely not. That, that is a blasphemous statement. God's desire is to save all mankind freely. Look with me, if you would, at Proverbs 21, verse 1. So the first thing that we looked at in hardening was this. Hardening doesn't necessarily mean lost. The second thing we looked at is that Scripture says both God and Pharaoh hardens Pharaoh's heart, and his heart is hardened through the rejection of God's Word. The third thing I want you to notice is that God can harden or influence the king's heart without violating man's free will. Proverbs 21, verse 1. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. As the rivers of water, he turneth it whithersoever he will. So can God turn the king's heart wherever he wants to? Yes. But notice the the metaphor that's used there. Water flows based on topography, right? So in other words, if if water is flowing in a certain direction, but you build a dam somewhere, what will happen? The water will change its course. Because what happens is you can affect the topography, you can affect the surface, but whatever you do, will water always seek its own level? It will. Are you violating the water's free will? No, what you're doing, if you create a dam or you create something else, you're changing the topography, and that may influence how the water reacts, but you're not changing the free will of the water. Let me give you this example. You ready? So, God is a master chess player. And what he can do is he can set up the board. He can set up the circumstances so that a man says, I want to make this move. And God's not violating his free will. What God is doing is he is creating circumstances where what does man do? Man looks at those circumstances and says, I want to do this, and it's man's choice. God did not make man robots, okay? He just didn't. And you know this because right now, if I wanted to, I could take this gavel and run around and hit everyone on the head. I have the free will to do that. I'm not going to do that, but do I realistically, could I? 
Yes. You have the free will moment by moment to do all manner of dumb things. And part of being mature in the faith is you decide, you know, I'm going to start doing less dumb things than I used to do. But you know you have free will, don't you? You know you do. You experience it on a moment-by-moment basis. The same is true with Pharaoh. The same is true with any other human being. God didn't make us robots. Let me give you an example of this. Nebuchadnezzar, get Daniel 4, verse 17. Daniel chapter 4, verse 17. Nebuchadnezzar, in many ways, is, is similar to Pharaoh. And you may recall that God decides he's going to bring a curse upon Nebuchadnezzar. So look with me at Daniel 4, verse 17. This matter is by the decree of the watchers and the demand by the word of the holy ones. Now notice this. To the intent that the living may know that the most high ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will, and setteth up over it the basest of men. And here's what the idea is. Do the kings of this world, what what they often do is they often think, I've gotten this power and control and dominion by my own worthiness, by my own brilliance, by my own cunning, because I deserve it. Isn't that how people often think, how men think? It is. And what Daniel 4.17 says about that, notice it again. The most high ruleth in the kingdom of men. Who's truly in charge? God is. And giveth it to whomsoever he will. Who does God give earthly control to? He gives it to whom he will. Men think, no, I grasped it. I took it by my own power. Well, sure, there was some self-decision in that. Sure, there was some, some volition and some will. But aren't you, king, just fortunate you didn't die as a miscarriage? Could you have died in childhood? Could you have died in an accident and never even lived to this time? The answer to that is obviously yes. And the point is, who actually controls who runs the earth? God does. Now notice this. And giveth it to whomsoever he will, and setteth up over it the basest of men. Are the best and brightest in charge of this earth? Not according to Scripture. They may think that, but not according to Scripture. Verse 25, that they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and they shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and they shall wet thee with the dew of heaven, and seven times shall pass over thee, till thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. So Nebuchadnezzar is the emperor of Babylon. He has vast wealth, vast power. Do you think that he eats using the value menu? I don't think so. I think that he ate very well. I think that he had very nice clothing. I think that he had servants that did his bidding. I think he lived like an emperor. Isn't that obvious? The pronouncement here is, King, here's what's going to happen. Madness is going to come upon you. You're going to flee the palace, and instead of eating steak and lobster, you'll eat grass like an ox. Like an ox. You won't have utensils. You won't have a chef preparing it for you. You're going to get down on all fours, and you're going to eat grass like an ox. And of course, when he first hears that, what does Nebuchadnezzar think? Who's going to make me, the sovereign of this domain, leave my palace, my military, and go get on my all fours and eat grass like an ox? Why would I do that? 
who will make me? Isn't that no doubt what he thought? Verse 32. And they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and they shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and seven times shall pass over thee. You're going to do this for seven years. Listen, eating grass like an ox gets tiring after six years. <laughs> you wouldn't want to do it anymore. But does God require this to happen for seven years? He does. Now, notice what it says. Until thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. In other words, Nebuchadnezzar, you're going to have this curse, and you're going to have it long enough till you know that all this wealth, power, dominion, control, none of that is by your own merit. It's because the Most High gave it to whomsoever he will. It happened to be you. And does this, in fact, play out exactly as it was prophesied? It does. But now notice with me verse 34. So God had caused this lycanthropy, this madness, where Nebuchadnezzar eats grass like an ox. Now notice what happens in verse 34. And at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven, and mine understanding returned unto me. And I blessed the Most High. And I praised and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. Did Nebuchadnezzar learn something from this experience? Did he learn something about the true God? Verse 37, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of heaven, all whose works are truth and his ways judgment, and those that walk in pride, he is able to abase. And what I want you to notice simply is this. When God brings this cursing upon Nebuchadnezzar, at the end of it, did Nebuchadnezzar have free will to respond however he wanted? He did. And he chose to worship the king of heaven. Well, the same thing is true with Pharaoh. God didn't force Pharaoh. He didn't say, Pharaoh, you no longer have free will. You no longer have choice. You no longer have decisional authority. You're going to just be this little robot that I program to reject things. That didn't happen. He had free will just as Nebuchadnezzar had free will. I say that all to say this, and we're going to go back to Romans 9, 19. When God hardens people in the Scriptures... It is not turning them into robots. It is hardening them because he sends to them his word, knowing they will reject it. It is not him making them robots. That is just nonsense. One more thing before we go on. If he makes them robots, they are not accountable for their decisions because they don't have any choice, right? Listen, if AI comes along and it's, if we start making robots and those robots malfunction, what do you do? Do you sit down with the robot and give them a stern talking to and say, bad robot, you shouldn't have done this? They're robots! They don't have decisional, unless we're really dumb, they don't have decisional authority and they don't have moral accountability for that reason. Right? Romans 9, 19. Romans 9, 19. Thou wilt say then unto me, why doth he yet find fault for who hath resisted, resisted his will? So let's unpack what's going on here. Thou wilt say then. That is Paul anticipating man's response. In other words, based upon what I just said in verse 18, thou wilt say then, you're going to respond by saying this. So let's read verse 18 just so we have it in our minds. 
Therefore, hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. So in other words, people will hear, whom he will he hardeneth, and they will respond to that by saying what? Thou wilt say then, why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? In other words, well, if God hardens people, then God can't find fault, because who can resist the will of God? In other words, Romans 9.19 anticipates the exact misreading of Romans 9.18 that Calvinism and other false theological systems produces. It understands men are going to misread that verse. Now, notice what it says here. Why doth he yet find fault? Men want to act like their hardening to the truth is God's fault. I'll put it this way. Men simultaneously want two things. They want to do whatever they want, and they don't want to be accountable for it. It's exactly how people are. If you've lived with people for more than 12 seconds, that's the magic number. You know that. Do people want to do what they want to do? They do. But how do they feel about giving account for their decisions? They don't like it, and you know that. So what they're saying here is, why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Now, what that verse is saying it's accusing God of being unrighteous and finding fault, isn't it? Why does God find fault? Because people can't resist His will, so why would God find fault with them? Get Genesis 18, 25. Genesis chapter 18. Now, this is a great verse because it captures something that's always true. Genesis 18, 25, that be far from thee to do after this manner to slay the righteous with the wicked and that the righteous should be as the wicked, that be far from thee. Now, here's the part I want. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Isn't the answer to that question always and ever yes? Does the judge of the earth always do right? right? And the answer is, yes, he does. Any theological system, any interpretation that produces the result that the judge of all the earth does not do right must be wrong. Amen? That's true. Now, get with me Romans 1, verse 20. Romans chapter 1, verse 20. Now, I'm going to read to you Romans 9, 19. For why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? And what men want the ability to say is they say, Look, God, you can't find fault because I'm just doing what you gave me to do. And what that is, is an excuse. It's not my fault. God, I'm just doing what you gave me to do. Look at Romans 1, verse 20. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, now, this is just my personal, private opinion. I think the next phrase is the most hated phrase in the Scriptures, so that they are without excuse. You know what the Word of God says about all of man's rationalizations, about all of his excuses? I'll give you the simplest example. You ever see someone snap at someone, yell at them, treat them harshly, and they apologize, and they say, you know, sorry, I, I'm not feeling well. Well, just let's be honest. Whether you're feeling well or not, you still don't have to say those things, right? Why do people say, well, 
I wasn't feeling well. What, what, what is it? It's an excuse is what it is, right? Aren't we really, really good at excusing our own behavior? Yeah, I did that, but you don't understand. I did that, but I had a reason. I did that, but... When a man gives account to God, how many valid excuses are there? None. 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 Well, when Romans 19 says, For why doth he yet find fault? What is that? It's an excuse. God, you can't judge me. Now, Get, go back with me to Romans 9.19 for a minute. <clears throat> Thou wilt say then unto me. So this is man's objection to the hardening. Why doth he yet find fault for who hath resisted his will? In other words, the argument is this. God can't find fault because man can't resist his will. In other words, God hardened me, and I can't resist that hardening. I can't resist his will. And so because God hardened me, he can't find fault. That's the argument. So let me ask you this question, or what we're going to look at is this. You see where it says, For who hath resisted his will? That is Calvinism. How many points are there of Calvinism? Five. What's the acronym that represents Calvinism? TULIP. What's the I? Irresistible grace. What Calvinism teaches is this. If God decides to bestow grace upon you and save you, you can't resist it. You have no choice. Get with me Acts 7, verse 51. Acts chapter 7 and verse 51. Now, Acts 7 is the stoning of Stephen. I want you to notice what verse 51 says. Ye stiff-necked, this is Stephen speaking, and uncircumcised in heart and ears... Ye do always resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do ye. So when people say God's grace is irresistible, they say so in defiance of what the Word of God says. What, what Stephen is saying in Acts 71 is he's saying, I'm preaching to you, I'm giving you the words of the Holy Ghost, and you know what you do in response to that? You resist it. And in fact, what does he say here? <laughs> Ye do always resist the Holy Ghost. In fact, you know what men do all the time? They resist the Holy Ghost. Get with me. Romans 13, verse 2. Romans 13, verse 2. Romans 13 and verse 2. We'll start in verse 1, Romans 13, 1. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Romans 13, 1 teaches Christian obedience to governmental authority is what it teaches. Verse 2, Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. So let me ask you this question. Do people ever resist the government? The answer is, of course, they do. And when you resist the government, what are you resisting? You're resisting the ordinance of God, according to that verse. So Acts 7.51 makes absolutely clear that men have the ability to resist the Holy Ghost. Romans 13.2 makes clear that men have the ability to resist the ordinance of God. So do men have the ability to resist God's will? Yes. They, they not only have that ability, they do it all the time. 
So in Romans 9, 19, look at it with me again. Thou wilt say then unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Making the argument, well, no one can resist God's will. The truth of the matter is almost everyone resists God's will all the time. Isn't that the truth? Of course it is. So Romans 9.19 is the objection of man that is completely and utterly false. Get with me 1 Timothy 2, verse 3. The argument in Romans 9.19 is God can't find fault because no one can resist His will. And of course, the, the truth of the matter is men resist God's will all the time. Let me show you one more proof. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will. So in verse 4, we're going to read about God's will. You see that? For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. Well, if it's God's will for all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth, approximately what percent of the earth is resisting God's will? Right? I mean, it's far more than 99.9. So does man have the ability to resist God's will? Yes, and he exercises that freedom all the time. So go back with me to Romans 9.20. See, what happens is Romans 9.18 talks about God and hardening people. And people look at that verse and they say, well, God hardens people and people don't have any choice. And then in verse 19, thou wilt say then, it articulates the exact objection that men are going to say. Why does God find fault? Because no one can resist His will. And the truth of the matter is the testimony of Scripture is men resist God's will constantly. So don't interpret hardening as to say, well, God made Pharaoh a robot, and Pharaoh couldn't do anything, and so Pharaoh's not accountable. That's not, that's not true at all. Pharaoh hardened his heart by rejecting God's word. God hardened Pharaoh in that he knew how Pharaoh would react, and he sent his word anyway, knowing what Pharaoh would do. God did not violate Pharaoh's free will. Romans 9, verse 20. Nay, but, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? This is what God thinks of that objection in verse 19. Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Here's what verse 20 is saying. God is the giver of life. Had God not created creation and given life to man, we wouldn't exist. And you know what men do? Men say, God, I have some feedback for you. There's some flaws in how you're running the universe. And so we should sit down and get a time together, and I can explain to you all the things that you're doing wrong. Now, you know what that is? That's nonsense. That's just absolutely, utterly ridiculous. That's the thing formed saying to the Maker, you messed it all up, but good for you. I'm here to give you feedback and straighten you out. And that's just, that, that's just preposterous arrogance is what that is. Look with me at Isaiah 29, verse 16. I, I, I think you get the point. What, what Romans 9, 20 is talking about is men look at how God created the universe and say, well, God, you did it wrong. And, and that's just, just a ridiculous, ridiculous thing for men to say. We'll look at Isaiah chapter 29 and verse 16. Surely your turning of things upside down shall be esteemed as the potter's clay. For shall the work say of him that made it, he made me not. Or shall the thing framed say of him that framed it, he had no understanding. And the idea here is, 
Well, let, let's do one more, and then we'll get Isaiah 45, verse 9. Isaiah 45 and verse 9. Isaiah 45 and verse 9. Woe unto him that striveth with his maker. Let the potsherd strive with the potsherds of the earth. Shall the clay say to him that fashioneth it, What makest thou? Or thy work, he hath no hands. Woe unto him that saith unto his father, What begettest thou? Or to the woman, What hast thou brought forth? And the idea here of Isaiah 29 and Isaiah 45, it's the same as if you you go into the art studio and you make a pot, and then the pot says, hey, you know, you kind of didn't do this right. You're like, well, (laughs) you're a pot. (laughs) Had I not made you, you wouldn't exist, so it's weird to have a pot. You know, it's like, do you go in and have a conversation with the washing machine? And the washing machine says, look, I'm really not impressed with the way you're doing the laundry. And, you know, I wish you would do this and that. It's, it's, it's absurd. You get it, the point. It's just utterly absurd for the thing that is formed to talk back to the, the maker of it. Now, what I'm pondering is whether I want to do one more. And I guess the answer is we're going to do one more. So get Romans 9.21. Romans chapter 9 and verse 21. Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? Now, just as Calvinists love the verse about hardening, because, you know, God hardens some folks and therefore they can't believe, that's the way they interpret that, They love this verse because what God does is he creates vessels unto honor and then he creates vessels unto dishonor and those vessels unto dishonor are the ones that are damned. Well, let's let's look at this. Get Isaiah 64 verse 8. What many do with Romans 9.21 is they read it as double predestination, meaning... God predestinates some for heaven and blessing, and God predestinates others for hell. In other words, the vessels unto honor are predestinated unto salvation, and then the vessels unto dishonor are predestinated unto damnation. Isaiah 64, verse 8. But now, O Lord, Thou art our Father, we are the clay, and thou art potter, and we all are the work of thy hand. Now, what people will do with that is they'll say when it says clay, they think of clay as inanimate, which it is, right? In other words, clay is just clay. It sits there, it can't move, it can't think, it can't purpose, it can't decide, it's just clay. And so they look at that metaphor and they say, oh, well, that's what we are in God's hands because we don't have purpose or intentionality, we're just clay. And so, God has to make us what He makes us, and and we're not responsible. We're not at fault. Well, get Jeremiah 18. Jeremiah 18 gives a lot of clarity. Jeremiah 18, verse 1. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise, and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. Now, I took a, I don't know if I took ceramics or it was just part of the art class, but I've had a little bit of training in ceramics. I'd say roughly that much. And What happens is you spin the wheel and you try to get the the vase, the pot to lift up, right? And you're trying to lift it up from the ground. And if you don't do it just right, what can happen? You can wreck it. it. It can be marred in your hands. 
And when you do that, what you do is you lump it together and you start over, right? Because you have a marred vessel. So you take the clay and you reform it into something different. So now we've covered the extent of my knowledge of ceramics. Now, verse 4, And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter, so he made it again another vessel as seemed good to the potter to make it. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter, saith the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in mine hand, O house of Israel. And so one of the things that Jeremiah 18 is obviously saying is that God can destroy and reshape nations as he wishes. That, 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 that's within his freedom to do. So the Calvinist looks at that and says, well, look, if we're clay, if we're a vessel in God's hands, he's going to form us into whatever he's going to form us. And how is the clay accountable? In other words, if I'm, if I'm at the potter's wheel and I'm raising up this vase and I mess it up, do I yell at the clay? Do I say, clay, how dare you? Why did you do that? I mean, if I yell at the clay, I'm just kind of a dummy, right? Because the clay is just something I'm forming. And so if there's a problem with the vase or the vessel, it's the maker. And so the Calvinist looks at this and says, yeah, this is what we've been saying all along, which is you don't have free will, you're just clay. And so how can you be held accountable? Now, this is where I'm going to show you some of the advanced study techniques that we use. Look at verse 7. At what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom? So is the clay here about individuals or is it about nations? It's about nations, obviously. To pluck it up, to pluck up and to pull down and to destroy it. If that nation against whom I have pronounced, turn from evil, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. Now, isn't the sense of those verses that the nation has free will? God pronounces evil, but if the nation repents, what is God going to do? He'll repent of the evil that he thought to do unto them. Look at verse 9. And at what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build and to plant it. In other words, that's blessing. If it do evil in my sight, that it obey not my voice, then I will repent of the good wherewith I said I would benefit them. The idea of those verses, if God plans to bless a nation, but then the nation decides, no, we're going to do wickedly, then what will happen to God's pronouncement of blessing them? He'll change his mind from that. Now, my point is, the potter and clay, this is what goes on. People read Romans 9. They say, we're clay. We can't do anything. We're just a lump, and we sit here, and God does with us what he wants. Well, if you do this really difficult thing, like read the passage that it's quoting, you see that it's all about free will. Doesn't the nation get to choose how it will respond? God promises to destroy it. He pronounces that he will. But if the nation repents, God says, well, I'll bless you because I always wanted to anyway. And if God announces he will bless a nation and then it does wickedly, then God adjusts that based upon their behavior. The potter clay metaphor. If you bother to read the verses is teaching free will because it's teaching the nations can choose how they respond. And by the way, the potter clay metaphor is about nations, isn't it? Now here's the proof. Watch this. Verse 7. At what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom? Verse 9. And at what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom? So what are these potter and clay verses about? Are they about individuals or are they about 
nations. They're about nations. Do you remember several weeks ago we were in Romans 9 looking at Jacob and Esau? You know the verse that says, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated? Was, were, the, were those verses about Jacob and Esau's earthly lives? Or were they about the nations hundreds of years after their earthly lives? And the answer is it was about the nations that were after. And that's what Romans 9 is about. And people take it and they instead say, no, this is about individual salvation and God makes people robots and they don't have any free will. And it's just an absolute, complete misreading of what the scriptures say. I'll, I'll, I'll close with this. Let's do Revelation 22, verse 17 again. I love Revelation 22, 17. I love this verse because it's so clear, it's so loving, and it's so clear in its expression of how God feels about humanity. People have this image of God sometimes that, that God is, you know, he doesn't want to save people or he's grudging about it or he's difficult. And that's the exact opposite of what Scripture says about God. Revelation 22, 17, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will. If people don't have free will, that is an incredibly cruel verse. What if I did this? What if, if I was a faith healer and I went to a hospital, to the paraplegic section, and I went around to all the people that were paralyzed, and I said, you lazy people, get up and walk. You're malingerers. You're fakers. If you wanted to, you could get up and walk. If I said that to them, that would be a wicked, cruel, evil, stupid thing to say, right? In other words, it would be mocking to go to someone that is paralyzed and say, stand up and walk. If men have no free will to be saved, if they can't control that decision, if they're robots, and the Word of God says to them, whosoever will, let him take the water of, for, of life freely, when God knows well and good that they can't, that would make him a cruel, mocking jerk. Isn't that true? If men have no free will and they can't choose to be saved and God's word says, whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely, it's a mocking, cruel, rude, obnoxious thing to say to a paralyzed man. It is. And that's why I reject Calvinism entirely. Because it makes God a cruel, mocking tyrant. It's utterly ridiculous. Strong letter to follow. Amen. Salvation is a free gift. Christ paid the complete penalty for our sins on the cross. You can have eternal life as a free gift forever simply by trusting the blood that he shed for you. Amen. Lord, thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. We pray, Lord, that each day we would come to better understanding and that we would perform the ministry of reconciliation that you have given to us. It's in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.